I'm really honored to have been asked to speak to the parents group by Annika and Casey and Chandra. Um, I've been involved with Fast and Female mostly as kind of an observer because our U.S. women's team is quite involved like your Canadian national team women are. And uh, it's probably the organization, the nonprofit organization that I admire the most. It is, uh, the impact is something that we won't see the results of until 20 years down the road when we're looking back on all the uh, amazing lives that have been directed positively. And I'm sure in some cases, somewhere along the line, lives saved. It's, uh, it's really an amazing thing, the empowerment through sport. So um, I'm in my eighth year coaching with the U.S. national team. My job title is uh, head women's coach. And so I work with seven, seven women. Um, I will be the first to admit that I know probably 5% of what I should know to be qualified for the job. And I found that that approach in coaching women has been my biggest uh, sort of foot in the door. Um, that sort of level of patience and uh, willing, willingness to learn from my athletes rather than to always trying to teach them. And uh, I'm really happy to help uh, share some of my experiences in, in training and coaching and just living and working with this women's team in hopes that perhaps we can draw some similarities between uh, coaching these elite women, your role as parenting some of these developing women, perhaps some of these elite women as well. If, uh, if I can learn anything throughout the course of this presentation or afterwards and you can give me some suggestions, I am more than happy to do that. In fact, I wish I had seen these little pamphlets. <laughs> tips, <laughs> tips for coaching the female athlete. <laughs> You serious? I have to get this right before my presentation. So, I would have. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I took three. Yeah, so I should probably uh, fact check this now. But my goal here is to just draw on some of my mistakes and uh, some of the successes too in uh, building a cohesive women's team. Because that, more than anything, more than funding, more than talent, uh, that sort of cohesive team, I think, is what keeps your daughters, your athletes. Um, in sport, and that's my number one prerogative. I feel like if we can have our athletes stay in that World Cup pipeline, training hard, living life, loving it, they're gonna get good. And good is a relative term, it's just maximizing their own potential and what's, what's, what could be more powerful than that. So um, in some cases that may mean winning World Cups and in some cases that may mean getting cut from the team almost after a year or two, but uh, it's still the process of trying to become great. Some of these activities have been really successful. This is the Center of Excellence in Park City. I've watched this fast and female develop in Park City, Utah. I think the girls had 40 their first year. Last year was 90 and this year uh, 140 showed up. And it's just that traction. Um, it's that consistency that seems to work more than anything for, for the, the U.S. programs. And it is, uh, it's really taken off. So. And other, other team building activities have not worked uh, quite as well for us. Um, this, is, uh, this is one of our A-team members. Uh, not long ago, we thought that going bungee jumping would, uh, would, would, uh, would really help bring us together. And uh, in fact, it did. It just took a few days for that, that one to soak in. Um, that's what she actually looks like. And it's, it's amazing what fear can, how it can just sort of really change. Uh, who you are and how you <laughs> how you look, so um, a little bit of history. When I got the job, uh, we were tasked with winning Olympic medals. And if you know anything about U.S. cross-country skiing, we have a 38-year drought with winning Olympic medals. So when they give us a task that we have no idea what to do with, um, it can be a little bit misleading. Um, and we we put a little bit too much focus on on performance, I think, first. And perhaps as parents or coaches, um, you can see where this line can be found when you uh, push your kids, which is very healthy, and finally you reach a certain level where you realize that it's having a negative impact or they're starting to rebel a little bit. And, and the same happens physiologically with, with our athletes and psychologically. If we push too hard before this team chemistry is ready, we're gonna have adverse effects. And so uh, we should have swip, flipped this around uh, in my first year and really set a two-year foundation for building that cohesive team before we put the pedal to the metal and, and tried to go after that Olympic, level, uh, that Olympic medal. 
um, as a result of, you know, perhaps putting a little too much emphasis on performance, um, we found that we were in charge of nearly everything. Um, we were the new guys on the team. It was myself and, and this guy, Pat Casey. And we were in charge of eight women. And uh, this was our second year, first and second year coaching the national team. And invariably, you're going to run into issues uh, with body image and disordered eating, not necessarily full-blown eating disorders, but the path is all the same with elite athletes, particularly endurance athletes. And what uh, the, the approach that we took based on our nutritionist um, guidance was to really control the amount of volume that they could ski out there. And these are athletes, these are thoroughbreds, you know, they want to just go out and hit the pavement for hours and be in the sun and be with their friends. And we found ourselves starting to control the volume so that we could get, in certain instances, calorie balance back in check, um, fatigue levels back in check. And uh, we were rebelled against a little bit. It didn't, it didn't get the effect that, that the nutritionist wanted us to achieve. We were over controlling things rather than allowing the athletes to educate themselves and to uh, find their own path through their struggles. And, and uh, this is something that in hindsight was, was, is now very obvious to me. Uh, you provide the information to the athletes and, and you see what they can do with it. It's, uh, in some cases, they're gonna wanna be told, do it this way. But in many cases, if you tell them to do it this particular way or that particular way, they're gonna do it 180. And, uh, and it's going to gain, uh, acquire the, the, the opposite effect of what we were going for. Overtraining, um, yeah, overtraining, calorie balances that were, that were not, not so healthy uh, because of training too much. And, uh, and in the end, it turns out that when we backed away, the athletes had all the information necessary and they went down the right path. It's very individualized, <coughs> absolutely. And, and as a male coach, one of the things that we've learned is that there are some of these topics that, that I won't touch. And uh, we'll bring in professionals. If it's a nutrition issue, uh, we'll bring in professionals. If it's uh, a, a physiological issue that, I, uh, that is above my head, we'll bring in a doctor or a sports scientist and, and to try and subcontract some of these issues so that we are not always the guy that's uh, that's in charge of making the tough decisions. But using the experts has been really helpful. And is it different than what's been meant? Or um, is it just this, the, these basics of just like general lessons? Or would, if you would have had a male team, would it be the same? Yeah, I think, I think it's probably a whole different presentation. And I'll just leave it as being, yes, it is, it is different than, than coaching men. And I think you can. You can really sort of uh, bully situations a little bit. Uh, bully is probably not the right word to use these days, but uh, but you know, really uh, use a stronger stronger hand in guiding these men. Whereas with the women, you want to really provide the reason with the direction you're trying to go, and to realize that some may may need to take a, a longer route or a more direct route. It's going to be with a with a team of seven seven different routes. So. So we backed away from some of the situations that we over-controlled, and, uh, and then we got the team chemistry quite, quite good really fast. Um, we have for a long time felt that uh, one of the biggest perks of our job are the athletes on our team and how well they get along. Uh, it's not just that we have seven women that are highly productive, great friends working together, but our guys team is also a huge piece of that. Um, I don't think we would have had the success that we've had were we just seven women traveling through the world competing against Russia and Norway and Sweden and all these other countries had we not had the men's team to sort of balance the stresses of competitive athletics. So we got the team chemistry right, but we were still a little shell-shocked from, from, from some of the stresses that we had created. and I. I think in, that in hindsight, when you have a team chemistry that is very strong, very secure, you can work athletes really, really hard and uh, gain, 
gain these, uh, these checkpoints that you weren't otherwise able to accomplish. And so I would have kind of reversed some of these things and started out my eight years with a national team, focusing first on team harmony and then on performance. And uh, I think things could have been uh, much smoother for us in those early years. Um, and so having learned from a few of these mistakes, um, we've changed a couple <laughs> things. So, um, evaluation and feedback, we're training these athletes twice a day. And some of your daughters may be only going to practice once a day, I would guess. Um, but they're being evaluated every time they go to practice. And that's a really interesting thing, particularly when you're training seven days a week, twice a week, and maybe it's me that's providing that evaluation. So four really kind of in-your-face evaluations, or sorry, 14 per week is uh, quickly getting out of balance if the athletes don't feel comfortable that they can provide me some feedback. And, uh, and so we've encouraged them to make this a two-way street, and uh, we tried just throwing some darts uh, at, at the board and, and found pretty quickly that we hit a bullseye with an anonymous um, little survey monkey uh, feedback form that I would highly encourage you to use in your club programs or encourage your daughter's coaches to use. It has been uh, constructive feedback or feedback of any kind, uh, perhaps particularly for men, I don't know, is difficult to receive and it has been the most educating moment of my year. Every spring and every fall we read those surveys that the athletes fill out anonymously, and you kind of <laughs> gather up your courage, and then you open the file, <laughs> and you just start learning. And it has been amazing. And what it has also done, it's not just these two points of feedback per year that we're receiving. The athletes now know, and they see these changes that I'm making, that all f four of, our, of their coaches are making based on these feedbacks, feedback opportunities. And they start providing it during the week, if I'm out there. Uh, providing some technique coaching, or Chris is providing some uh, instruction on how to do this or that, they're more apt to say, you know, I'm not really ready for that right now. Could, could I ski a lap or two? So we've really opened up the, the pathways to give feedback. One of the big philosoph uh, philosophical points of our coaching staff is to just bring high energy to uh, every session. And this has made it much more rewarding for us. We're always tired. The athletes are always tired. I mean, it's a sport of making athletes tired and then really rebuilding them back up. So you're just playing with their moods and, and uh, they're showing up exhausted at the end of the week and really fresh at the beginning of the week. And the approach has to be a little bit different every day. But if we as coaches can show up with sort of a predictable demeanor, some high energy, that can, uh, that can really stabilize the situation. And uh, we found that if we, if we want to be there, then they do too, and uh, we've, had, we've had good luck with this, this one. Um, and, I, and I touched on being predictable. Uh, that, is, that is one of the most important pieces, I think, of our philosophy as a coaching staff, um, is to show up as Matt Whitcomb <laughs> or as Louisa, the same person you were the day before, uh, something that the athletes a product that the athletes know to expect. Um, they don't open the wax room door and look to see what Matt Whitcomb they're going to get that day. Most of the time, that's my goal anyways. Uh, it's not perfect, but, uh, but it really levels out this, uh, this point of potential stress that can be uh, very evident on some teams, and ours in the past at times too. And so when you have coaches showing up, just the same as when you have athletes showing up, with volatile mood swings, um, it adds this level of stress to a team that is really unnecessary. So this has been a big piece for us, and it, it creates an opportunity for athletes to be a bit more emotionally volatile because we can absorb that a bit. And I think a lot of the coaches that I watch, um, these staff in the back, I mean, couldn't be, couldn't be much more even, and I think that's one of the best ways of gaining an athlete's trust. Um, our most successful athletes are certainly independently thinking, and uh, we, we all know coaches. I had some as as an athlete um, growing up that that really liked me to do their training, um, and then I had other coaches that really liked me to help them come up with the training. And this is a picture of Keegan Randall um, on one of her earlier World Cup wins. 
Uh, and I, it's, a, it's, a perfect, it's a perfect photo because it just shows how happy Keegan is, and that's obviously on one of the best days of her life, but she's about that happy every day. If uh, she runs into a bottle of champagne, she's going to pop the top. <laughs> um, but Keegan's had a big role in um, guiding what we do at training camps. And I would say that all the athletes on our team have a big role in that and have some sort of role in dictating what they do for training tomorrow, what they do this afternoon. Um, this afternoon they can either go for a one hour easy recovery ski or they can go for a run on their own out in the woods. And this has been a great way of gaining some sort of investment from each athlete. If they're deciding uh, a little bit of what they do within certain parameters, uh, we, we find that they are more invested when it's time for us to tell them what they have to do. And so in some cases, Many of them will even write their own training plans and then submit it to the coach. And that, is, uh, that has been quite, a, quite an interesting process. And with some athletes, they'll send something back to you that is far better than what I could have created um, because it involves how their body actually feels. And as coaches, we're just making educated guesses on what should come next. And, uh, so an athlete's role in their direction has been, has been huge for us. Probably my biggest piece of advice that I, that I received when I started coaching the women's team uh, was to underreact. And I'm a kind of a fix it sort of guy. Not that I know how to fix everything, but I like to fix it fast. <laughs> and uh, that really doesn't work, I've found. Um, because every day we see these little problems and they may be emotional problems, they may be problems with the wax, um, and I have learned to take a step back to assess the problem and in some cases not fix it. Um, some cases let it be fixed by the athlete um, or to take a moment to come up with a solution that has a little bit of thought to it. And uh, this for me has been a really challenging one and it has given me the, big, the biggest sort of impact. Um, for our team, <laughs> you know, this Fast and Female, as we give this presentation, these group projects fostering a sense of pride in what we do, um, pretty quickly elite athletics can become uh, very selfish. It can, it can, in some ways it, ha it is inherently a selfish endeavor, uh, but it has so much more value to it than just that. These ambassadors are role models for the sport that they represent. And they're out there right now doing a group project as ambassadors that tightens up their relationship to one another. But then these little kids out there, these 9 to 19-year-olds, are also developing some sort of, cohesion, some sort of cohesiveness and uh, developing this little level of pride, this team. And it's maybe just a team that only assembles once or twice a year with Fast and Female, but it is so important. And for our team, we'll do little things where going to launch a poster challenge uh, this year. We're just going to just try and draw some uh, importance to club and team pride. And so by Christmas time or whatever date we come up with, all of these clubs throughout the U.S. and maybe we'll try and go a little bit international with it, have to take a photo of their team in their uniforms. They have to have a motto and they have to submit us with a file. And we're going to print out a copy and try and hang all these posters up together with the hopes that they print out some for themselves and get this poster of their team on the wall. Because that, that involvement, your daughter's involvement in a team, it, uh, you can't say enough for it. And this, is, this has been a great thing for us. We did a video contest uh, and we had 35 teams submit a video of their team training and they were all levels of seriousness and goofiness. And the girls sat, we, we, we set this two hour block to watch these videos and we ended up watching them over three days because there were so many of them. And they brought tears to your eyes. Because, uh, and, and to mine too, because I could watch the girls suddenly realizing the impact that they were having on the US skiing community. And uh, it's, it's, it's taken what can be a selfish endeavor and has, has, has broadened it to be something so much larger. To be a role model is, uh, you can't put a price on that. And so um, the impact Chandra and Elena and Rosanna and all these girls have is, uh, it's something that you don't see the impact of for many years 
down the road when all of a sudden you realize, wow, my daughter is a great leader all of a sudden. And it's because of these things, these teams and these group projects. Um, as coaches, we are definitely willing to be wrong. And I love this photo because this was, uh, it doesn't show up super crisp here, but uh, on my computer it does. These are just perfect classic tracks, and this is the day when we decided to skate. And uh, <laughs> this is Sizer all Middley. I mean, it looks like the Rundle Mountains, to be honest, but uh, it's up in the Dolomites. And, uh, but, but it's much more than that. It's, it's about us uh, maybe overtraining an athlete or booking a ticket wrong. <laughs> Uh, we are asking these athletes to fail every time they go out and push themselves. We did uh, uh, eight by eight minute intervals out there today. And they're, they're on video, you know, and that we're testing their blood lactate and asking for their heart rates and for their times. And if they get slower, it's not a big failure, but in some way that can be assessed as a failure to the athlete. And when they realize that we're not perfect, that we can say, we really missed that peak. <laughs> I really messed up your Olympics or your world championships or overtrained you that year. When we can own some of our mistakes or <laughs> missed book the ticket um, for the wrong month, just random examples, <laughs> uh, they are much more willing to, to put sort of things on the line as well. And uh, that's, that's been another one of those sort of two-way streets. If we can be wrong, they're more willing to risk failure. And when you can risk failure, there's, uh, there's no, better, no better way to, to improve. I think Michael Jordan had a quote. It was something like, I missed 9,000 shots in my career, and I wish I had the quote here. Maybe I do, but, um, but it, was, it was all of those missed shots that made him better. And uh, I very much sub subscribe to that as a coach as well. It's a... Uh, it's it's an individual sport, you know. This is the top of uh, this is Jesse and Keek and Jesse and Liz um, at the top of a seven-kilometer time trial in Anchorage, Alaska. It goes from Turnagain Arm up into the hillsides, up into the mountains, and uh, it's in-your-face feedback every time you go out and race yourself against your former times that you've <laughs> logged throughout throughout your years training, or you go up against your teammates that your coaches are telling you are your friends. Um, it is an in-your-face environment. But we've, uh, we've really started to focus on the relays. Um, there are team sprints in cross-country skiing, and there are four-person relays. And we'll do these events uh, where we create little fun team relays that we've done with the Canadians quite a, quite a bit in Bend, Oregon. And we've tried to absorb the pressure of an individual sport by fo focusing on more on the team events. And the example would be Keegan, I think, where she comes into many World Cups as the favorite to win the sprint or one of the favorites to at least win a medal. And now that there are other athletes on the team focusing on their own, uh, their own races but on the team events for which Keegan is also a member, it's sort of distributed the pressure throughout the team. Um, and so. It's a tricky thing in an individual sport. Is everybody here involved in cross country or biathlon? Or you said hockey. Oh, you said hockey, sorry. Is it mostly cross country skiing and biathlon? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's one of the challenges for sure. And to figure out little tricks to make it a team event, I think, can be invaluable. There's no question that it is easy to build strong women. As a junior coach, I remember. Um, you could, you could train athletes very, very hard, and as long as they were talented, you could get them to be top 10 at junior nationals and look like a really smart coach. And, uh, <clears throat> but they tended to burn out pretty fast. And for women, that's not a whole lot different either. It's, uh, it's not hard to build any one of us uh, strong and to look somewhere along those lines. <laughs> uh, like I said, it's, it's all a path. Uh, you know, leave the sport. Um, have success early because you push too hard and uh, you know try something different rather than what we're trying to do is to get Keegan here who's on the left to stay in the sport until she's 34 or 35 and if she can do that we feel like we can maximize her potential or rather she can maximize it but if she left the sport at 26 that would have by many measures been a very long career she would have never won a world championship medal she would have never won a World Cup globe. And these were things that were so far away from 
what she was attaining when she was 26 years old. So if we can have athletes stay in the sport, we've found that we can have some success starting in the early 20s. And I don't know, I don't know if that's just because we're racing in our small microcosms here. Uh, it's hard to get out of Canmore. It's hard to get out of Utah. It's hard to get out of North America. And, uh, but for the Europeans, they can race internationally with a quick drive. It's easy to make them strong, but it really does only count if they're happy. And I love this photo. It's, it's about 15 minutes after the nine-stage tour to ski event. And you can't tell that one of them has a broken wrist, that one of them had a great race, and that one of them was really fading. Um, they don't wear it on their face. You know, and they, uh, they know that uh, they're just happy to be teammates. We're just lucky to be alive, to have a job that is all about being in shape and, and to be a uh, positive role model. And uh, when that sort of uh, attitude can be realized, some great gains are made physically. And so really, this is it that happy athletes are our secret, our, our secret weapon. That doesn't mean we always race fast. We have abysmal days sometimes when we came into it very happy. <laughs> but in general, I feel like our team has had success because we've been cohesive for about six years, very, very cohesive. And, uh, and it's made a world of difference uh, for coach retention. <laughs> We have our coaches wanting to come back to coach the team. We have uh, great relationships with the, with the athletes' parents. And it's, uh, it's just begun to work for us. And I think we are only starting to gain traction here. So um, this is a big one. And I really hope that kind of throughout this presentation, you're able to draw some perhaps similarities between coaching uh, women that are aged 22 to 31 this December and some of your daughters that may be nine years old. Maybe you have some that are significantly younger than that. But out there, I think it's nine to 19. But that's kind of how we've done it. Uh, there are certainly uh, some highly scientific approaches that we use with some help from our doctors and physiologists. But uh, that stuff's only 1% of it. It's, it's making sure we have af happy athletes, and then we can go and turn the screws on the training. And they will work really hard, and it will be absorbed. And, uh, and they'll go home having kicked each other's butts or gotten their butts kicked from each other by each other, and they'll be happy. They'll be OK with it. And so um, we're only beginning to learn how to do it better. But uh, these, these simple things, I think, are, are giving us uh, that level of patience with our lack of knowledge. <laughs> and. Uh, I think the athletes appreciate the, the approach. So I don't see uh, the American and the Canadian teams as, as much different, to be honest. I think uh, all of the Canadian athletes that uh, I've worked with and have mingled with, and we do camps together often, uh, a lot of great similarities. I mean, the North American culture of endurance uh, sports, particularly skiing, I think is a very special one. So that's what I have. Uh, love any questions. I always would love suggestions. Uh, my email is attainable um, if you have thoughts after the fact. Um, really appreciate the attendance. But uh, we, our coaching staff is a learning staff. And, and, and everything you see up here, none of this was uh, an idea that I came up with on my own. I could give you a few uh, people that were responsible for different points here and there, but it's a, it's a culmination of a lot of people coming up with some pretty cool ideas, um, many of which came directly from the athletes. So.